Okay, folks, we are joined by Howard Simon. He has been in the media covering uh, Bill Sports for 33 years. Um, a little bit of, we have to clarify something. There's a quote that someone said he retired, but he said, no, he isn't retiring. He's simply calling it a career. So I'm not sure what that exactly means, but he's been on a WGR for what, 15 years? 18. 18, sorry, okay. And uh, a very familiar uh, voice uh, on, on Monday mornings for me. I always wanted to, I felt like he had a great pulse of, of the team from a media perspective. So uh, thanks Howard for joining us. My pleasure, fellas. Yeah. I, the quote was, I'm not retiring. I'm just not doing this anymore. So, <laughs> oh, that, there you go. I'm okay. still working. I'm just not doing, you know, talk radio. That's a that's very that, that's a fair way to put it. So so Howard, we're gonna we're gonna start off. Uh, we do something called the uh, opening drive, where we ask you ten kind of rapid fire questions in two minutes, and uh, just to kind of you know. Whoa whoa let people... whoa! Okay, I'm gonna stop you guys there. Okay. You're talking to a guy. I'm a talk show host. <laughs> well, I talk for four hours every day, and I did it for 18 years. I don't talk rapidly. So, well, how about we will ask the questions rapidly, and you can answer them in any way. Okay, in any I don't way answer you anything quickly anymore. I'm really <laughs> sure. hard. I'm just apologize. Fair be, enough. Be as deliberate as as you. Well, like. the opening drive doesn't necessarily have to be two minutes. Sometimes it's one of those longer seven or eight minute, you know, <laughs> scripted play stop, drives. Watch and set it to twenty seconds. Fair enough. <laughs> so right. uh, now that uh, you're retired or, or not doing this anymore, where do you think or where have you watched a Bills game in the most interesting place? Uh, let's see. You know what? I enjoyed this past season, fellas. First time ever. I watched a couple of road game, a couple of games in Bill's backers bars. Nice. I've never oh, done that before. I was in New York when they played the Packers and I was in Orlando for the home game against the Jets. We went out for both of those and it was amazing. Awesome. Did you, did you connect with them? Did they know who you were or uh, you just York, anonymous or it's funny. New York was like, Nobody, nobody said anything to me in this huge bar in New York City on like 33rd Street, wherever the hell it was, doesn't matter, in Manhattan. Uh, I connected with someone who was co-organizer of the Bills Backers of New York, said, hey, I'm coming out there. Do I have to get there early? I don't know how this all works. And he was nice enough to reserve me a table. Nobody said anything to me the entire night. <laughs> in Orlando, so they had a guy like a DJ basically running the show, right? So, you know, in, in between with commercials, they play music, all that stuff, guys. He knew who I was. He was a big fan of the show. So he was like, hey, VIP here tonight. It's Howard Simon. Everybody applaud. For and I had me do a couple, like, drawings and ticket stuff. So it was, like, complete opposite, fellas. New York, I walked in and walked out. <laughs> That's it was funny. Great. I was just another person. You could watch the game, at least in New York. It was probably so <laughs> cool. Orlando was a little bit different, but that's all yeah. right. I, that comes yeah. with the job. All right. Uh, well, hey, three people, dead or alive, that you'd want to dine with. Oh, my God. Fellas, you're killing me. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll probably go, well, my all-time favorite player in my entire life was Tom Seaver from the Mets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would, I would pick Tom Seaver. Mm -hmm. I'm a presidential nerd. I'm a big history buff. So I would probably go with history guys. I would be like, you know, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. I'm a big time history nerd. So I can would probably pick those guys. Can never go wrong there. So yeah. you're, you're entering an arena. You're the main attraction. There's dry ice. What's your entrance song? <laughs> Can I use Timmy Trumpet, the Edwin Diaz? Oh, there you go. Well, you're the only you're the only one that'll be using it this year. So, <laughs> yeah, he's that's right. He's not entering anything. Yeah. We have to rehab so yeah. I don't know if they play it at rehab. Right. All right, staying in the music theme, uh, you're the best concert you've ever seen. Oh, that's a tough one, fellas. But um, I mean, there's two guys I love more than anything else: Springsteen and Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. I saw Springsteen play one time in Washington at the Nationals Park. He played three hours and 45 minutes. It was amazing. And honestly, when it was done, I thought, can you play another hour? So I'll pick that oh, one. Wow. wow. You're a New York a New York City area guy, so you got a Jersey and a Long Island guy there, right? In Springsteen. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Billy Joel, right. Long Island, and Springsteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jersey. You know, if you're from Long Island, New York City, you kind of look down on Jersey. But that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll let it slide this time because of Springsteen. That's funny. Right. I feel like we can ask you this question now that you're uh, off the air. What's your favorite Buffalo restaurant and what do you get there? Uh, I Oh, geez. Guys, you're, you're killing me with these questions. You're it's doing so great, Howard. No, it's taking thought. I don't like to – now that I'm not <laughs> working anymore, I don't like to think. We're, we're, uh, this is your warm-up. So we'll talk career after this. Good one. I'll tell you what. Um, 
this is probably not, I don't know. I, I don't really have a favorite, but there's one place that I've gone to and we love the food every time. Grapevine Restaurant in Amherst. Mm, yep. On yeah, that Niagara Falls Boulevard. Yep. Didn't love Van it. Miller oh. used to advertise for- Van for Miller was their spokesman. That's right. Uncle Van yeah. did their commercials. Yeah. He, he gave me a couple of uh, gift certificates there at a restaurant. I, at the time, I couldn't have afforded otherwise. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, I told I, Amy, hey, I'm taking- I'm good old Van the, wasn't asking you for free food to the place. Yeah. <laughs> good old Uncle <laughs> okay. Van. Yeah, there's funny. an inside story there. Uh, what do we have? Uh, your favorite cartoon growing up? Bugs Bunny. Love it. All right. Uh, 99 Sabres or 0607 Sabres? 0607. Mm, okay. More entertaining team. No offense to the 99 squad. I mean, the guy, the goalie was superhuman out of this world. Unbelievable. But the 0607 team was flat out fun. Mm. Yep. Agreed. All right. Uh, <clears throat> most annoying fan base in the NFL? I have an answer. But I'm not going to say it because my son works for them now. <laughs> oh, so okay. I'll go with this. any team in Philadelphia. <laughs> there, you <laughs> there you go. go. That's fair enough. It's Santa Claus, right? That's funny. Uh, two more here, and then and then we'll uh, we'll move on. Uh, can you drive a stick shift? No, I tried once. My brother had one when I was in uh, college, and he tried. It was a little uh, uh, what the hell was it? A Fiat? I don't even know what it was. Doesn't matter. He took me out one time, guys, and I'm like trying to clutch and move this and do that and. <laughs> It was a disaster. That's the only time I tried it. I will never drive a stick. It's weird. So your favorite uh, sports movie of all time? Boy, you're really killing me, fellas. That's a, that's like asking which child you love the most. <laughs> Top three. <laughs> uh, okay, that's easier. I love Major League. Hmm? Uh, boy, no, I don't see that. No, I don't. <laughs> Slap shot. Okay. Of course, yes. Um. I suppose I'm supposed to say the natural because we're in Buffalo, but I'm not going to do that. Um, Honorable mention. Yeah. I Hoosiers. There oh, you go. Excellent. I've, I started watching Ted Lasso recently. Oh, it's great. Love oh, it. It's but great. It, it, it's very much off the premise of Major League where the uh, – at least so far, with the owners intentionally trying to yep to, yeah. to, to sabotage yeah, yeah. yeah no it's yeah. great it, it really it yeah. it really works so Howard let's uh you know let's go backwards and maybe you can talk about how you got into you know sports broadcasting journalism and, and how you ended up in Buffalo and then how you ended up on GR well I'll give you the Cliff Notes version I sure. got in broadcasting because it was the family business mm -hmm. um, so I grew up on I grew up on Long Island my dad worked. For well, he didn't work for the teams, but he worked for the company that um, put the games on the, on the television: the Mets, the Knicks, and the Rangers. He was the director of their telecasts. So my brothers and I grew up around Madison Square Garden and Chase Stadium. We grew up around the teams. We were big sports fans, but we also, for you know, for me, as much as it was cool meeting the players, we got to meet the broadcasters too. And there were some legendary. If you grew up in New York City. Guy by the name of Marv Albert, you guys probably remember oh, yeah, him. Sure. He did network stuff. Marv yes. was like the god of play-by-play -play men. If you grew up in New York City, and the Mets three announcers were very famous too: Lindsey Nelson, Bob Murphy, Ralph Kiner. So I was one of those nerdy kids who would sit there and have the game on television and turn the sound down and get his little tape recorder and do play-by-play -play into a tape recorder of a game on the television. I always found. I love sports, but I always found the broadcasting end of it really exciting. And then when I had a chance to meet the people doing play-by-play -play through my dad, I was hooked. So that's how I got into sports broadcasting. So then did you you, you went to school for it, I'm assuming? I, I came to Buffalo, and that's kind of how I ended up back here. I, came, I went to Buff, Buff State, excuse me, Buffalo State University yeah, now. Right. <laughs> uh, I went to Buff State, majored in broadcasting, loved it, had a blast, could not get a job here coming out of college. I found my first job in Elmira. And then I went to Toledo, Ohio, and I spent five years doing everything but sports. Mm -hmm. I did news. I was a disc jockey. I played country music. I did public affairs programming. I did traffic reports. I worked every shift and every job not named sports. And then I got a break. There was a station in Niagara Falls at the time called WJJL. And they were looking for a sports guy. And somebody up there knew me, a guy I went to college with, said, hey, you should call this guy. And I was working in Toledo playing country music. So they <laughs> called. I took the job. I got here in 89, and I've been here ever since. Was, was your goal to ever get back to New York City or no? Never. No, no. You know what? Honestly, I never really thought about it, guys, because it was the number one market. It was so hard, right? It's It, it was really hard to get into New York because everybody wanted to be in New York. So I never, you know, I knew I had to get a lot of experience to try and get a job down there. And honestly, you know, the, I love New York. Don't get me wrong. 
I've been upstate and I had lived away from New York so long. I had no desire to go back and deal with the traffic and the people and all the stress of New York City. So I'm I'm very happy I stayed where I stayed. That traffic is is incredible. I go yes. home and I visit my family. I swear I get so freaking stressed out. <laughs> You can't beat, but the thing is, you can't backdoor it. Like, you could have super secret ways to go to a Bills game, right? And avoid sure. a lot of the traffic and go back ways, right? It's impossible to drive from Long Island into Manhattan or Queens. My son's in New Jersey. You can't do it, fellas, without no. getting stuck in traffic somewhere. And it's expensive. I, I, I think five years ago I was there. I was driving from Jersey City into the city, going to the Bronx, and the Holland Tunnel, and it was like $13. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit more than that, but it's... 13 to 16 bucks for a bridge or a tunnel. That's oh crazy. So so you so you get back to Niagara Falls. What year again? 89. 89. So you're 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 perfect timing. Don started yeah. in 88 as an intern. I say he has right. incredible NFL timing. Uh okay. obviously you did as oh, well. So you're why they went on the run. I didn't realize it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so talk me through <laughs> your memories. Like what what were you doing uh during like the Super Bowl era? Like how how different was the coverage like for you guys back then? Was it was it did you feel a, a part of it being at a, like a smaller radio station out of Niagara Falls? And what about um, eight, 89 itself was a juicy year for the Bills to right. cover? Right. Well, that, now that's my first season here. Now, I wasn't covering them a lot when I first got here. So I was basically a one-man sports department at JJL. You know, I had, after, I had afternoon updates that I anchored. We did some play-by-play, -play, but I also, you know, covered the Bills and the Sabres. The first year, though, there was someone else on kind of helped out on staff, kind of volunteer basis, and she was covering the Bills. I really didn't start covering them until their first Super Bowl year. Now, I didn't travel either. I, I would cover – I would go out to Wednesday. Wednesday was the big media session. You go out, you get all your interviews, Marv Talk, Kelly, everything, and then I would cover home games. So I didn't travel. Um, I didn't even cover any of the Super Bowls. We didn't have it in our budget. The only Super Bowl I got to was the the last one in Atlanta because at that time I'd already been hired by WBEN and they sent me on the road. So I missed three of the four Super Bowls. And like I said, I so I wasn't full time on the beat, guys. It was so it was a little bit different for me. But I was, you know, I covered all the home games. I was there for fifty one to three and for a lot of great times. Yeah, couple couple things going back to you getting into the industry. It's interesting. The last couple of guests we had, Sal Capaccio and Mark gone. Sal Capaccio did the exact same thing as you, were recording his own voice, watching a game, uh, yeah. and 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 Mark on went to Buff State. Yeah, just kind of you you have your own lane here, but I, it's funny to see the similarities and some things. Mark did was you? at the record, and Sal Mayorana from the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle who covers the Bills. Those guys were at the record. Bob DeCesare, who used to be at the news, they were all at the record while I was at uh, the campus radio station WBNY. It was pretty cool. Yeah. That's that I was I was going to ask you. So those guys who started covering the team, you know, late mm -hmm. '80s, early '90s. Obviously, it was it was much smaller media presence then. I, I worked at the Bills for for four years back in the late '90s, and I was always amazed that in the administration building on Wednesdays they'd have the opposition, uh, uh, you know, uh, calls? conference yeah. calls. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and 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 you guys would all be in that like that that open room on the third floor actually like right yep. across from your office. Right. And it, it was kind of amazing that you would mill around with the coaches and the staff and the players. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really open access. Like how different was it? Maybe you could explain to people back then just how, how more informal it was and how different it was than, than it is now. Well, it was, I mean, it, sure. It's less people for one thing. You're right. It wasn't really a media room. It was just this, um, I don't even know, Don, you would t tell me, I don't know what they used it for, but it was just a, an open room with tables. They'd bring out the podium, but the elevators are right there. Like people are walking yeah. in and off the elevators while Marv is holding his press conference. We didn't have access to the coaches. Coaches were on the second floor. So we were on that top floor. So the only access we had in the back row of offices was media relations were in that back row. Denny Lynch, Scott Birch told those guys were in the back. But John Butler, well, polling it would have been back then, the the personnel people, the coaches, everybody, they were on the second floor, and we were pretty much under orders to not go down to the second floor. Like, we <laughs> knew, not the elevator, not the staircase, stay away from the second floor. So we hung out in our little room there um, all day, just doing our work there, waiting for the locker room to open up. And it wasn't a big media contingent. It was, you know, the Buffalo News would have a couple guys. Rochester would send a couple guys. Sal Mayorana and Leo Roth. Vic Carucci would have been there for the news. Larry Felzer, Sully was probably there. The TVs would pop in, one one person from each TV station, me. It wasn't much beyond that. It was a small group. 
Yeah, they didn't use the room for anything else during the week. Uh, honestly, it was just really for you. Uh, and you're right, media relations was back there, so yeah. maybe it was easy access to them. There was a stairway to get up there, I think. But yeah, there was. There was a yeah. stairway which would take you down to the sec, well, all the way down to the main level. So oh, because um, there were on occasion, we we did a um, show with John Butler. Uh, we did a show with Marv Levy. I would, on occasion, have to take that staircase down to the second floor to get John to come up for his show. Yeah. If it's any consolation, when I interned there in 97, I was also told to not go on the second floor. For <laughs> any, <laughs> anyway, the second floor was like, was like you know, like the Wizard of Oz area. You, you didn't right. go, you did not go, Don's office, I, I worked for him and his office was on the third floor. So I, I you know, immediately skipped that second floor. There, there was I, a feel no, like, I feel like, no I, I, I feel like Pauline would have had an alarm there. Like there, I feel like there would have been some kind of alarm if a media, that would sense a media member walking into the lobby area of the second floor and like buzzers would go off. I think he took it further. I think there was actually like a flesh melting force field that was there. Yeah, maybe 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 you could talk about like how how the organization was under you know different GMs like when you were there. Obviously, you know Bill Polian is his reputation speaks for itself. And then, you know, John Butler was probably a little bit more relaxed, like yeah. a little, and then, <laughs> you know, going from there, like maybe you could just kind of tell people, you know, how it felt to cover the team under different, under, under different people. It was good. I mean, I, I never really had a problem. I mean, you knew, obviously you knew there were limits. Um, you know, you didn't walk around freely and, uh, but, but, so, but I, I never felt, you know, there's there's always that battle between media relations, the department, and the press, the media core. But I never really felt we were seriously prevented from doing our jobs. If there, Polian, I'm sure Polian was a little, a little bit tougher than John Butler. Polian, I mean, I, I, it never happened to me, but I was told stories like he'd wake up, he'd see a story in the paper he didn't like, and he'd be on the phone to you know somebody complaining about it. He was a very sensitive about media coverage. I think John was the same way, but he approached it in a different way than Poli. And so it was different covering the team under both of those general managers. When I, I didn't have a close relationship with Bill Polian because I didn't do his radio show. By the time I got to BEN, we started doing a show with John. John was great. I love John. What a great guy. Like John would invite me into the GM's office after hours. We'd be there on Wednesday. I'd do all my work. He'd say, what are you doing? So I'm just finishing up my work. Come on down to the office. He would pop the television on and he'd be watching like a college basketball game or an NBA game. And he'd, he'd just hang out and watch the game. Uh, there were times on the road. You guys remember Dwight Adams, right? One of, one oh, yeah. of oh, yeah. Great King guy. Of, King of the draw. Oh, my God. He was he was fantastic. There were times on the road uh, where John would say, hey, you know, we'd, we'd fly in on a Saturday. And John would say, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to go grab dinner with the media guys. Hey, when you're done, come on up to the suite. So I'd go up to John's suite, and he and Dwight would sit there and watch college football all night. Scout. I mean, they'd be scouting. and be like, yeah, you come on in, Howard. And I would just sit there and hang out, watch these guys, watch the football game. So it was, it was a very different atmosphere with him. Now, he could lose his temper. He could get angry about the media, for sure. But I think he was, like I said, I think he did a little bit more behind the scenes. So it was a little bit different. Marv was cool, guys. Marv was like, Marv was maybe the easiest head coach I've ever had to cover in my entire career. Yeah, John Butler and Bill Pulley. In my, my early years, uh, the Super Bowl years, I was in the ticket office. So I don't know if you ever would have come in the ticket office except for maybe to get your Super Bowl tickets or something in the, in the lobby. But we were behind there. <clears throat> there were no walls, no windows by design because it was a vault and they were hard tickets and they were essentially cash. Right. But uh, when Bill Polian would just have a meltdown upstairs but didn't want – to be heard because he was in an open area there where Pat Kazar, he would come in the ticket office and smoke and just, just smoke and smoke. Our ceilings were yellow. What are, it's okay. What are we going to do? He knew Jerry Ferran very well. He was like a comfortable uh, person to him because they both came over from the Chicago Blitz together. And, uh, but yeah. Did you, did you find it challenging or like when you guys, uh, you hosted the John Butler show? So were there any times where you were like kind of some questions were off limits? Did you feel like like it was tough to, you know, kind of question them, challenge them? It was it a different relationship because you were almost like an official, you know, media member of the Bills? Yeah, I don't not really. John was a pretty cool guy. Um John could handle the questions. Look, I knew at 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 the end of the day he was only going to say so much, but 
I, I never was told. Now, again, we were not the flagship, by the way. The games okay. are on GR. That's a little bit of a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. I think that relationship between the team and the flagship station, to your question. But I was never told by John or anybody, you can't ask this or you can't ask that. You know, John John would basically say, hey, man, I'm, I'm a big boy. I can handle it. And he would answer or non-answer whatever the question was. But I, I was never told you can't bring this up. It was, I would. It's part of the job. He understood it. And then it's up to him to how he answers it. And then it's up to me. Do I do I follow up? Do I press him? Or do we, you know, go in a different direction? But he was pretty cool with all that stuff. Did he ever, <clears throat> since you got to know him, you were watching ball games together, did he ever say something and then say, hey, Howard, that's off the record? <laughs> Not really, no. Oh. Um, but, I, I mean, when we were watching stuff, it, you know, it wouldn't have been anything Bills related. It's not like, yeah, yeah it's not like, you know, we're watching a football game and he says, hey, by the way, the Arkansas linebacker, we're drafting that kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. <laughs> you, know, yeah. Just, you know, what I, I was, it was just who they liked, why they liked this kid. Hey, you look what he said. You know, look at this kid's mm. backpedal. It was really kind of, like I said, it was, it was as if scouts were breaking down tape of players. I just happened to be in the room. So those are those are two great guys to just hang oh, out with. I mean, they're they were like caricatures of what yeah. like a pro football GM and scout would be. Like if you were going to draw them up on paper, John Butler as a GM and Dwight Adams as a scout are like the perfect yeah. caricatures. Of, they are of Dwight. Them. It's like it was like they were speaking a different language when I went down to the scouting area of the building. And I remember they were looking at film, and <laughs> Dwight said about this guy, I don't like this guy. He's got wood toter's butt. I'm like, wood toter's butt? And he goes, Don, what do you – pretend you're carrying wood. <laughs> okay, you walk. And what happens is you try to get the leverage, by, and your butt goes in. He goes, I, he goes, I want a bigger butt on, the, on a guy than a wood toter's butt. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> One time I, I didn't save the list. But I used to talk to Dwight every year before the draft. He would let me come down to his office at the stadium. And we'd sit down. I'd turn on the recorder. And I would just run through, you know, the top five or ten prospects at literally at every position. And he would get – by the way, this doesn't happen today, right? He sure. would give me his thoughts on all of these guys. And I would run these specials on BEN. Hey, today we're looking at running backs. Here's Dwight Adams talking about filling the blank guy. So – Two things off of that. One, you're right, Don. At one point, I actually started keeping a list of his <laughs> phrases, you know, like plays with his hair on fire, uh, tougher than a $2 steak or whatever the heck, all these. And I didn't save it because he had so many of them. But the yeah. best part was because he was so amazing. So I'd come into his office. He'd be sitting behind his desk. I, I would have in front of me a list of all these names, quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, 10 deep. He had no notes in front of him. Well, he had nothing. I would name, what are we talking about? How many positions times five? I don't know. 50 guys, whatever. All off the top of his head. Every single detail. I mean, it's like he had a book of all this information, but it was up here. And he would just rattle off everything about all these guys right off the top of his head with no notes. I swear to God, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. That's yeah. like Mel Kuyper. That's it, like, yeah, like a, yeah. It, was, it was in the brain, and it's like the Mel Kuyper guide in Dwight's brain. And he was just flow, going through the pages as he was talking. Yeah. About. I love those meetings. He was with, fantastic. With the super draw. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that was part of the fun. The, yeah. the, charm, the southern draw, the personality. He was great. Everybody yeah. loved talking to him. How about, how about from, a, from a player's uh, perspective? How, who did you enjoy to interview? Is there any like real memorable locker room interactions yeah. that, you, that you remember? And maybe somebody who you didn't like to interview for one reason or another. Oh, I, well, there are, you know, there are a couple guys that were just, you never knew every, like I said, Wednesday was the big media day. And you never knew what to expect each week from Bruce Smith and Thurman Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk, they won't talk. They might make you wait for a while. And I, I, I saw Thurman. Actually, Thur Thurman was nice enough to come to my going away party oh, uh, the right. night of my final show. He showed up downtown. And I, I told him this story. I said, Thurman, there were times he would go to his locker. He'd, he'd shower. He'd go to his locker and he would be getting dressed. And what you would do, guys, if you wanted to talk to a player and you didn't want to miss him, you know, walking out, going home. The media would gather around this guy's locker and either he'd stand there in the towel and he'd do the interviews or sometimes guys would want to get dressed first. Then they would just turn around and they would face the cameras and we'd do all the interviews. There were times when Thurman would just take his time getting <laughs> dressed. He wouldn't talk after practice. Let me shower. He'd come out. He would get dressed. And there were times where he you know, would just 
skip it. He was like in a bad mood. And I, I kidded him and I said, you know what? As much as we didn't like dealing with you when you're ornery, I knew that you were going to have a big game on Sunday if you were kind of testy with us on Wednesday. So that was always a good tip off. Bruce was, you know, Bruce was moody. You know, he was, you never knew. You had to talk to him. He was a, obviously a key player. Every week we'd want to talk to him and you would just kind of flip a coin. Is he talking today or not? Um, the, the guy, you know, I always get asked that question about favorite interviews and everything. And there's one guy that, and I, I miss him, Kent Hull. Uh, one of my all-time favorites. That's, that's, who, that's who Mark Gaughan said. That's who Mark Gaughan said as well. Oh, my God. And I, they have an award uh, named after him now, right? The Kent, there's a Kent Hull. Like, um, it goes to an offensive lineman, I think. Yes, who, yes. Who's good with the media. I think yes. Sam Dawkins might have won it. Yes. Super. One of the greatest guys I've ever covered in my entire career. Um, from a media standpoint, just a, first off, a great player. A wonderful human being. And from a media standpoint... Remember what I said about the other guys? Didn't matter. Kent Hull would always talk every Wednesday, every Sunday. It didn't matter. He was always there, always willing to talk. I love, I miss Kent Hull so much. Scott's going to agree with me. I see he popped in. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> a couple minutes ago, I was. it looked like I was texting because I was. I had to send him a new link, so I, I was listening. But there you go. So Scott, welcome. Uh, the former VP of uh, Media Relations for the Bills, who, of course, knows Howard and wanted to uh, say congratulations in uh, a little exchange here. Thanks for coming on, Scott. I did. I did. I guess it's. Time for me to come in when we're talking about Kent Hall, right? Oh, so, yep. no, Howard, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say congratulations on a fantastic career. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe that you did this for as long as you did and brought <laughs> the passion that you did all those mornings. Boy, oh, boy. You, you know, I, I think your job is very difficult because so many people look at it and think, oh, well, I can do that. You know, it's not that hard. I don't know if they realize how much work goes into it, what a talent it is. That, of course, you've had for so many years to be able to do that and really give the fans a voice. And I thought you did a tremendous job over all those years. We didn't always see eye to eye on things, but you know what? It was it never affected our friendship. And uh, And I just want to take the opportunity to say congrats, and I hope you're doing well. I am. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was, um, you're ruining the narrative, Scott. I, I don't, people think all we do is just, we're sports fans. We sit down, they turn on the mic and we blab. There's no prep. There's no work involved. This is the easiest job in yeah, the world. Right. Don't ruin the narrative. Well, that's let me, I had a question for you. Actually, I had a couple of them for you, if you got a minute. So I get asked this all the time, and I thought it would be fun to hear where you were. Where were you in Super Bowl Twenty Five when Scott Norwood attempted the field goal? Well, I know where you were. I was not in yeah. Tampa. So I was telling the guys earlier, yeah. the station I work for in the falls, we just didn't have a travel budget. So I, I was in my apartment on Grand Island with my then girlfriend, now wife, just the two of us watching the game. And, right. uh, you know, didn't didn't really end the way I hoped it would. So, yeah, I was just watching it with her. Right. You said yeah, earlier that first. you were waiting for your credential and you never got it from Scott. <laughs> oh, don't get me in trouble with Scott. I don't want to. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. No. Kidding, kidding. No, no, no. First of all, for that game, it didn't matter what Scott thought. It was run by the league. So That's the true. league yeah. was the one that gave out the credentials. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it's always interesting. You get asked that question. I was going to start this out by how would you come a long, long way from WJJL radio? So, <laughs> Tell me about it. Oh, my gosh. You know, the other question I have for you was, and you'll have to remind me here, where were you when, where were you in your career when 9-11 happened? Hmm. I would have been on the air at NSA. So okay. I had been at Empire in 2000. They moved me over to radio. I was actually on the air that morning doing the morning show when that happened. Right. And it's it's interesting, Scott. We take, we at that time, we would take a top of the hour news update from a national service mm -hmm. so at right. nine o'clock the update at nine o'clock included some headline about a plane that flown into the world trade center so mm -hmm. i just thought oh it's probably like a two-seat cessna some guy had a medical emergency and he went into yeah. the tower and moved on alan wilson was on at, with uh, the late alan wilson from the buffalo right, news right. just right. in that nine o'clock segment and as the hour developed obviously we learned more and more and more, and we, en we ended up going to, like, CNN radio or something like that. But I was on the air when it happened. 
Well, the reason why I ask that is because I know for the football team, it was very hard to focus on playing a football game. Yeah. You know, and I and obviously the NFL, I thought, did a great job of uh, procedures and, and when we were going to play and all that kind of thing. But my question to you is, how hard is it as somebody that's in radio doing sports to carry on and do your job when at that point, you know, I don't know that people really want to talk about sports. Right. And then eventually it gets to a point where sports helps heal. It's part of the healing process, as many people would say. But how difficult is it for a guy like you to go on there and and try to focus on something with sports when nobody wants to talk about it? Yeah, it, it's 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 challenging. And, and it's hard because, again, I, I talk about sports and that's my, you know, that's my fastball. I'm not really, you know, geared to do other stuff. Right. But um, and I'm trying to think back, Scott. Like, I mean, you can think about 9-11. We were on the air. Mm -hmm. I came into right. work uh, and, and found out overnight that uh, the crash of 3407 had occurred. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. Uh, that's another one. Yeah. We were on the air Monday after the, the top shooting last, yeah. uh, last year. So right. it's not, it's a difficult area. It's uncomfortable to get out of your, you know, that's a little safe zone, right? Of sports, mm -hmm. but sure. it's life. You know, you just, you know, you know what you do, Scott? I think at the end of the day, there was no textbook. They didn't teach me this one at Buff State. You just tell yeah. people how you're feeling. And I always looked at it. Days like that are kind of like radio is therapeutic. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost like, you right. know, hey, we're here. Just call. You want to cry? You want to yell? You want to right. talk about a baseball game? We're here to help you through this, whatever way we can help you through this. Well, like I said, for so many years, you did a great job. And, and <clears throat> moments like that are so difficult. Again, I know with the football team, it was like, you know, for the front office guys, we just wandered around the office and went in each other's office and talked about it. And nobody talked about football. Right. And I, j I just wanted, because I know it had to be so difficult when you're on the air. And that's a whole different ball game, so to speak. No yeah. pun intended. So yeah. I would say, you know, but, the, uh, the losses, the losses hurt so bad. And you're right, Scott. We commiserated with each other, but uh, we right. also, I, you know, we also had a commute to work. And I got to say, I would throw Gr on and hear Howard. And I always thought you captured um, the, the sentiment uh, of you know where the team was, whether you know don't overreact or underreact, but did a real good job. I always found comfort listening to you uh, on the way into work. I got to yeah. say. Do you, know, you funny, have a? Scott, can I just say something, Scott, real quick? Yeah, um, yeah. It's funny. I was thinking you'll you'll remember this because you were there for Marv Levy's retirement ceremony, hmm. and I it, absolutely. Correct, you can correct me. I don't have the exact quote, but Marv said something about one of the reasons he was getting out. The losses were just getting harder and harder to take. Like the wins, great, but the lows of the losses and bouncing back from it was getting harder and harder. And quite honestly, I thought of Marv a lot because at the end. You know the Bengals game. Yeah. the The losses were just getting so hard to come in Monday morning and you know try and suck it up and get everybody through it. Yeah. Well, well you're so. right, and and Marv did say that, and I've heard a number of guys say that, and they'll tell you that the wins are still the wins, but you take losses so much harder. Yeah. And I think when you're at that point in your career, um, you know you're probably getting near the end because now it's affecting your life you take it so much more uh personal and, it, and it's you're right it's extremely difficult to to uh handle the losses but uh, you would have went but, through you know, again you back on your that too yeah oh, oh yeah sure absolutely and uh especially if you if you start to think about you know your career and you know it's coming down you yeah. have a good idea in your mind i remember marv always said marv and don you'll remember this marv always had the saying that if you're thinking about retiring you probably already retired yeah. so, <laughs> true so so about, and, and right. i was just so i i was just so happy that my last game i i is when the patriots we played them in the playoff game at our place and it was freezing cold and we beat them and i thought this is this is a good way to go out to beat the yes. Patriots like this. Good for you. You so with hey, both of you like retiring, you thrown out of your last game. <laughs> that's right, Steve Tasker. Yeah. With well, both of you retiring, that, that, well, that, you, you, 
what do you look forward to doing, both of you now? You're, you're both in the same thing. Like, what is it you couldn't have done, but now you have the time to do uh, and not think about losses anymore? Go ahead, Scott. Oh. Um, for me, it's okay. I moved to Tennessee, so I'm down here in Tennessee and uh, enjoying some nice weather. Sorry, guys, I had to throw that in. <laughs> and uh, and I've got a huge photography interest. So I, I when I first retired, uh, I was shooting a lot of sports at Orchard Park High School, uh, and they use it for the school. They used it for yearbook. Uh, a lot of my photos got picked up in the B newspapers, that kind of thing. So I've got a huge photography interest and I'm continuing to pursue that at this point. Howard? And for me, I, uh, well, for one thing, I'm not waking up at 4 a.m. every day, yeah. which is really <laughs> cool. Um, I'm doing <laughs> stuff that's fun. You know, I'm doing play-by-play. -play. I love play-by-play. -play. It's always been my first true love in broadcasting. I just couldn't make it work with my schedule over the years. So I'm doing some play-by-play -play with the local colleges. You know, the games are streaming, so I pick up that. I'm doing some work part-time for the Bisons in the press box. I'm going to be the guy uh, every now and then. If the pitch clock doesn't work properly no. at the stadium, <laughs> I'll be the guy screwing it up. Um, and I'm going to spend some more time with my wife. You know? <laughs> I think it's really cool too. It's, this is not a coach's story. I didn't sleep at the office and work 18 hours a day in the building. But, you know, football season and the job, it, it can affect relationships. There's not a lot of time. So I am now going to spend a little more time with my wife. I'm not sure if she's happy about that or not. But anyway, <laughs> that's that's the plan going forward. That's great. Awesome. That's great. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're we're gonna leave it there with both of you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much, Scott, for for joining us. And I know that you wanted to say, you know, hi and congratulations to Howard. And Howard, thanks so much for coming on. We'd love to have you come back on, you know, maybe closer to the season and and talk maybe a little bit more current bills, yeah. uh, you know, going forward. Anytime, right. I'll uh, I'll be around. You guys know where to find me, and I'll still be following them. And Scott, thank you very much for coming on today, and and thank you for everything you did over the years when you were with the Bills and I was, you know, trying not to drive you crazy. <laughs> Good stuff. Howard, great all to right. see you. Best of luck. Keep in touch. Good all luck right, to you too, right. Scott. Thank Take you, guys. Care, guys. Thanks, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks to both of you. Before we go, we're going to uh, feature Don's favorite segment uh, on our show uh, for people who've been watching us for a while. Uh, we're going to spin the wheel of failed Bills coaches. You never forget that. No, of course not. You can't forget that. I think we're going to add a, a little special feature for our first Sunday night broadcast. I think we're going to also include maybe an administrator. So oh, we're going to spin the wheel okay. twice. Uh, what? We're going to go. I didn't sign up for twice. Okay, fine. It's a, it's a special Sunday, Sunday night, night special. Yeah, right. bonus, yeah. So, bonus, so okay. you know, we're, we're going to spin the wheel twice. And just to remind any, anybody who has, has, has not watched our show yet, Don was the director of football administration for the Bills for 13 years. Uh, the Bills made the playoffs exactly zero times. And these are not failed coaches. These are failed Bills coaches. And we're just going to spin the administrator wheel. We're not going to call it the failed administrator well, wheel. We'll just call it the By virtue of, of the last one, it was Tyke Tolber who went on, though. The Super Bowl. Correct. It happens all the time. It hurts when that happens. Of course. Yes. I'm happy for them when I yes, when I like them. So they are not failed coaches. They are just failed Bills coaches. So that that By virtue of not making the playoffs. Fair enough. Right. So the the wheel today has spun on a interesting name, Tony Sperano Jr. Tony Sperano Jr. Uh oh, stumped. This may be the first time that. Tight ends coach, 2016. He, I remember him, but the whole point of this is for me to come up with a specific story. Um, and I, I guess it's going to have to be <laughs> unceremoniously that he really just stayed in his lane. As He's they the say. son of Tony Sperano. That's right. Correct. That's right. The, the Miami coach. And I almost feel like he was told uh, be seen, not heard. Or, okay. or you know, where just he he uh, he really kept um, low there profile. Two, he was there low two key. years. Right. 2015 I re I and 2016. Him. I do remember him. Yeah. I, I, I wish I had more to add. Uh, you know, nice, nice person. But uh, he 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 didn't put himself out there in such a way that uh, all right, a well, story that I can attach to him. We have a late uh, addition to the wheel. Steve Cragthorpe. Steve Cragthorpe was a, he was from Colorado. He was the offensive coordinator and uh, he was a guy that liked to tell stories about um, uh, plays that they ran in college. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's which proud of his offense? He 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 was, and, and I think uh, was there a Houston connection to him too. But uh, I remember a Colorado for sure. Okay, and a lot of a lot of coaches didn't like to do that. Like if they if you happen to be sitting down with them at the table on you know the road meal or something, uh, you know he, he would automatically. Hey, I remember a play we ran at, at that. Worked. Oh, really? Like, to you? Yeah. No, but we there were there. Were, yeah, whoever was at the table, like there were always there were always TVs on. It was we were there on a Saturday, oh, so right, college right, football right, right. was on, okay, okay. or on Sunday morning. Sure, we'd be in a meal room and they'd watch have college football highlights on. Okay, and I remember he would. Oh, I remember we, we ran a play like that when I was there. And, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, nothing wrong with that, I suppose. To a point. Fine. No, I, to a point. Yeah, I could see how it might get a little old after after it a bit. might only happen a hand a couple of times sure. that, okay but i just remember uh you know so many so many guys had rich deep deep college histories that and but they never talked about it right but he did interesting okay well yeah. there, there you go so let's uh let's let's spin the wheel of administrators here uh for the first time mm -hmm. and let's 2016 i think it was a new department which i think is it, it has definitely grown and I'm, I'm curious your take on it the director of analytics michael lyons mike lyons is he still there? No. Okay. He got let go, I want to say, the same year I did, but late in the year or okay. early the next year. What did the analytics department look like in 2016? Was it just him? It was just him, just Mike. In fact, his office was right next to me. And uh, he was I – don't, I don't put this label on too many people that I've ever met in my life, but he was a bona fide genius. Okay. Um, I would dare say – at the expense of when you're trying to have a conversation with him, he process literally mm. processes it all the time. So you don't know how he's feeling about what you're saying to him sure, because sure. he just he would okay. nod and nod and nod, and then he'd wait, and and then he would give you some kind of reaction, but never during you couldn't read okay. him at all. Okay, because he he was a, a genius. And I remember, I remember um, Kevin Megank. I think Russ Brandon had had made a big deal about when he was going to have oversee some of football. He was going to do analytics, and uh, we we they looked for like a year for a person. Okay, I think they they had a person that they they want he wanted, but Jeff Littman ended up interviewing him and saying no. But okay, and Jeff said okay. My my clients is the guy, and <clears throat> he was in the first day he was in the building. I hadn't met him yet, and Kevin Meink. Uh, came to my office or no, I called Kevin and said, Hey, you met the new analytics guy. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah. I said, Oh, is there going to be a press conference? And um, he goes, let me tell you what, after you meet him, Oh, tell me if you, if there's going to be a press conference, just, just a quiet introvert. And uh, like, this, this guy sure. will have no part of being uh, had a press conference. So what, he just what, wasn't, it wasn't. Do you remember wired. what he did? He, um, he was frustrated because he was under the impression that he was going to analyze, um, you know, situations, situations yeah. third and one, I can't third imagine, and one, fourth and one. I can't imagine Rex Ryan being a real analytics friendly head coach. Um, <clears throat> somebody must have spoken with Rex because, believe it or not, his staff did more with football than I think the previous staff did, almost like someone told him, hey, you know, we got this guy and you're okay. not, we're not using him much. And so Rex didn't interact with him personally much at all, but he had some of his football guys talking with, with Mike Lyons quite a bit. And, okay. and I think he, he finally started to feel like his position was justified. The analytics department has grown yeah. substantially since then. Yeah. Mike, Mike was, uh, I think he went to MIT again, just a genius. Right. And it's interesting that a guy like that would choose professional football. Because I'm sure with his intellect and his background, I'm sure he had like a mathematics degree yeah, or whatever. it was. Probably could get paid a lot more money doing something else, right? I mean, the NFL will pay well in certain circumstances, but he, he could be making more money if he is like a yeah. PhD from MIT. Right. I would assume analytics director of an NFL team has prestige, and, and but, but not, not the biggest payday. No, he, he was a huge fan of the team. He's from Rochester. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I remember I would sit in the press box during games, but he chose to sit out in the stands. Like so he had no role on game day? Not game day. It was almost like, really? yeah, that's a good point, really, because you would think I think all, all the information that he came up with, all his analysis, I think was already, it's there. It's written okay, down. They're, sure. If they're going to use it, they have it. They don't need, he didn't feel a need or he was never asked to be like, you know, it's third and one. Where's Mike? Yeah, you right. Know, well, sure. You know what I mean? Sure. But I guess, I guess personally, I would just want maybe him av available. 
you know, if, if he's was, spending all week analyzing these things and he's a, and he's a genius, I guess I would just maybe <laughs> want him you know, available. It, I guess it's a it was a really interesting situation because I think they just made stuff up as they went along. Not the analytics; they were yeah, real. Yeah. But the role of this person and, sure. and how to maximize it because it was early. It was early in the whole yeah. NFL team analytics. Were the Bills one of the first teams to get, have an analytics person or department? I think so. Okay, yeah, I think so. They they have a, they have a legit department there now. I think of two or three people. I have not met them. They came on after I. was That would be there, a really but... interesting like week to follow them. Just see what they do, like during the off season. I mean, I know, I know, as as a QC, as quality control, do a lot of self scouting and, and all. But I, I, like the analytics guys, I, I would find that interesting. It's almost a shame that it wasn't there when you were there, because yes. you could have, I would have figured it. out a way yes. to to extract the most from a person in that position. That was would have. That was that was it, it, like there was no such thing back then. I mean, there was not even a thought of that. And right. and frankly, I remember the old joke running around that you would have been better off. A lot of the NFL head coaches, like late 90s, old school guys, including Wade, time management, clock management, they were awful. Mm -hmm. And the old joke going around was that you'd be better off hiring a 12-year-old who played Madden <laughs> because, you know, they would be running all yeah. these different situations and, and, and specific game scenarios right. where it's tough on a sideline. I mean, you've got... 20, 30 seconds. And this brings me to a point about the, the 2023 Bills. Sean McDermott's going to call the defensive plays now. Yeah. yeah the play calls. Right. That's going to make it challenging for him to make the, the game time decisions as well. And I'm wondering if he's going to pawn off a bit of that responsibility to somebody upstairs for not to say that they're going to make the final call on a fourth and one. Obviously, that's going to be the head coach. Right. But he's not thinking about the game situation if they're on defense. It will be. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure they're talking about it now. I mean, I, they have to be because you're right. That's a big adjustment. I mean, Sean's been the defensive coordinator, but uh, they're going to need to to have that all coordinated. He's never been yeah. a defensive. Co He's never been the play caller and head coach at the same time. Right. Exactly. And that's that's a challenge. Wade Wade did not call the plays. Ted mm. Cottrell called the plays, and of course, Wade was famous for not having the headset on, <laughs> which I found. Even we have headsets. <laughs> but, but, but you know what? If you were on that staff and you had Carl Mock in your ear, you wouldn't want to have a headset either. I, I, I chose to not have a headset for, yeah. for a specific reason. and <laughs> So I, I guess I didn't blame Wade. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us tonight. And uh, we're going to have a couple of interviews next week. And we'll see everybody Follow soon. Follow us on If Buffalo. Yeah. Oh, there you Twitter. go. Twitter. Good right, job. Right, right. <laughs> Take care, everybody.